Hello, and welcome to this film about intermolecular forces and solubility. Um, hopefully you've just come to this from the film about hydrogen bonding. It's the last film in year 12 on the bonding topic, so you're coming up to a test fairly soon, probably. Um, but uh, there's really nothing too much new in this film. It really just combines some of the things that you've learned about intermolecular forces so far. So hopefully it makes sense. If it doesn't, I suggest you go back and watch those films again, perhaps, and just review what you've been doing. Hopefully, by the time you finish watching this film, um, you'll be able to use your knowledge of intermolecular forces and think about what forces there might be between the solvent particles and the solute particles before we make a solution. And then once you make the solution, what new forces might come about and use the kind of before and after to try and predict whether something is going to be soluble or not. Okay, solute, solute forces, what do we mean by this? These are the forces that exist within the solute before you dissolve it. So for example, if I was dissolving hydrogen chloride in water, there'd be some dipole-dipole forces here, right? Because hydrogen chloride is a polar molecule. Okay, so before I dissolve it in water, these solute particles have dipole-dipole forces between them. Here is some randomly chosen um, covalent molecular substance that only has dispersion forces between its molecules. Okay, So this might be some um, substance that I'm planning on dissolving in a solvent, and before it's dissolved, there are dispersion forces between the two between one molecule and the next, there they are in between the molecules, okay, because of these instantaneous dipoles. Okay, so that's what we mean by the solute-solute forces. Hopefully, by this stage, you're able to look at the substance and the formula of the substance and decide by looking at the shape of the molecules and whether, uh, whether there's electronegativity differences, you'll be able to decide whether the molecules are polar or not. And perhaps whether there's some hydrogen bonding between the solutes particles. Okay? Here is, here is just a look at a couple of solvents. There's many, many solvents in chemistry that you could use. There's not that many that you come up against in year 12, to be honest, and water's by far the most common. So here's a, here's a picture of the solvent-solute, solvent-solvent forces in water. Okay, so there's a molecule of water and another. And in between the two particles of solvent, um, we've got hydrogen bonds, and they're the strongest intermolecular force in water. Here's a petrol molecule. Okay, quite often we uh, dissolve things in petrol. For example, you can use petrol to remove grease stains from, uh, uh, well, or grease from items that you want to degrease. If you dip them in petrol, it dissolves the grease. Um, this is a non-polar molecule. Okay, so there's not going to be any hydrogen bonds. There's not going to be any dipole for dipole forces, but there's going to be dispersion forces. Okay. Now, why are we looking at these solute, solute forces and solvent, solute, solvent, solvent forces? Well, because when I dissolve something in a solvent, I've got to break the solute, solute forces. So I've got to break whatever forces there were here. And then that solute's got to be fitted in in between the solvent particles. So I've actually got to break the forces in the solvent as well. And once I do that, then I'll create some solute solvent forces. So there'll be interactions between the solvent and the solute. Okay, and this picture kind of shows us dissolving a substance in water as it happens. I mean, this is by far the most commonly used solvent by human beings. It's not the only one, and that's a mistake that a lot of people make as they think of water as being the only solvent. Okay, but this diagram shows us we've got some kind of solid, we put it in water. What happens? Well, the solute particles get surrounded by water molecules. They get in the way of the water molecules as well, but they get surrounded by water molecules. So here are these solute solvent forces, right? Any solute that we use and any solvent will establish some kind of forces between the two. And if these forces are strong enough to compensate for the forces that we broke, then the chances are that this solid Will, or it could be a liquid dissolving in another liquid, um, will dissolve in it. Okay. If they're not strong enough to make up for it, then the chances are this thing won't dissolve. So in other words, if there's very strong solute, solute forces, for example, but quite weak solvent solute forces, then it's unlikely that our substance will dissolve in the solvent. So if we look at some immiscible mixtures or some insoluble substances, okay, um, 
if I put petrol with water, they won't mix. Okay, that is to say that is an immiscible mixture. They'll form two layers. Okay, and that's because there's dispersion forces here as the strongest force. There's hydrogen bonds here as the strongest force. Put them together and you get dispersion forces interacting with water makes dispersion forces just like any other. But we've lost these hydrogen bonds and we've replaced them with just dispersion forces. So we've kind of lost out there, right? We've taken some very strong intermolecular forces and replaced them with quite weak ones. So these two don't mix. Okay. Similarly, if I put sand in petrol, okay, these two substances don't. Dis well, the sand doesn't dissolve in the petrol because the forces that I make between these two substances, silicon dioxide and petrol, will be just dispersion forces because I've got dispersion force. This molecule is only able to make dispersion forces. But I'd have to break covalent bonds in sand right, to dissolve it, silicon dioxide. I'd have to break, it's a network covalent substance, I'd have to break massive amounts of covalent bonds, and they're not going to be replaced by similarly strong forces. Okay? If we look at some miscible mixtures or soluble substances, for example, if I take, um, water keeps coming up here, but that's okay. If I take ethanol and mix it with water, beer lovers everywhere will be delighted to know that those two things mix okay they will the ethanol will dissolve in the water or I suppose if you had lots of ethanol and not much water you could say that the water would dissolve in the ethanol the ethanol C2H5OH has a really polar part to the molecule okay and it can hydrogen bond because we've got a hydrogen directly attached to an oxygen water as its strongest inter intermolecular force also has hydrogen bonds put the two together and they can hydrogen bond with one another so although we're breaking quite strong intermolecular forces when we're making the solution, once the solution is made, we replace them with quite strong intermolecular forces. So we haven't lost out, so to speak. Okay? If I take, for example, sodium chloride. Sodium chloride is actually an ionic substance. Okay? Um, and we'll look more at these kind of forces in the solutions topic, which comes up after Christmas. Okay? But... For the time being, let's just mention briefly, this has got ionic bonds in the substance, and you think, well, they're quite strong, so they're not going to want to break. This has got hydrogen bonding in it, but water molecules, with their polar nature, okay, can actually surround ions. So, sorry, there's a chloride ion. The positive parts of water molecules can form quite strong interactions with the negative ions, just like the negative parts can form strong interactions with the positive ions. So because we're forming quite strong interactions in the solution, we can overcome the strong forces that we're having to break in the solute and the solvent. Now, quite a lot of people end up thinking of this as just being like dissolves like. Okay? And that's not a bad starting point, but it's not going to get you marks in an exam. So if you say to yourself, right, well, okay, Nonpolar solvents will dissolve nonpolar solutes. That will give you an idea of whether the thing will dissolve or not. But an examiner is not going to give you any marks for saying like dissolves like ever. Okay. So although it's good to think of, let's say, uh, uh, two nonpolar substances like the ones we mentioned earlier, grease and petrol. Why does grease dissolve in petrol? Well, like dissolves like is a good starting point, but there's no marks for it. What you need to say is that the dispersion forces in Greece are broken, the dispersion forces in petrol are broken, and they're replaced by dispersion forces between the two substances. So because the new forces are strong enough to compensate for the forces that were broken, this substance will dissolve. Okay, So we're always going to try and make a statement about what forces have we got in the solute. What forces have we got in the solvent? And what forces have we got in the solution? And then we can make a comparison between their strengths. And if we decide that the ones in the solution are pretty much as strong as the ones that we broke, or stronger, then we can suspect that the substance is going to dissolve. Like dissolves like helps us decide whether this is going to happen, but it doesn't get us any marks. So make sure you remember that, and make sure when you're explaining why things dissolve, you 
have enough detail, not only about the forces in the solution, but also about the forces in the solute and the solvent before the solution is made. Okay, that is the end of the bonding topic. So um, good luck on the test or good luck on the exam if you're using this as exam revision. And um, the next topic that you do, which might be in a little while because it might be after the Christmas holidays, that's solutions and calculations. So good luck with that one. And if it's coming up to the Christmas holidays, enjoy your Christmas holidays. San Diego.